so, just as you might have understood, uh, this song is about the Armenian genocide. Uh, the name of the song refers to a place where many masculine, or one of the masculine, sorry, took place. Uh, so, I would now like to introduce the first speaker of the evening. I had him for history of civilization. Uh, and uh, his knowledge in history impressed me. So, I'm very happy to have him here tonight and working with me on this. He earned his doctorate at the University of South Carolina under the direction of the late Dr. Owen Connolly one of the preeminent scholars on the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era. While at UCS, he was chosen to work on the private papers of the late American general, William C. Westmoreland. He has both studied and conducted archival research in the United Kingdom and France. While a graduate student, he taught at Longwood University, Coastal Carolina University, and was the history lecturer for the Opportunity Scholars Program at UCS, or USC, sorry, for three years before accepting a tenure track position at Gordon College in 2006. He came, to, he came to MMC in 2008 and is currently an associate professor of history, specializing in political and diplomatic history. Please help me welcome Dr. Scott Hahn. Thank you, Daniel, for that nice introduction. My job tonight is just to talk a little bit about historical background of what is going to take place. Because once the genocide starts I will, in um, April of um, April 24th, 1915, I'm going to turn over to our speakers. Because what's more important tonight is here, they're still with us. Now, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire had been around since the 1300s. By the, between the years 1908 and 1913, now the, the Ottoman Empire faced the greatest threats that it had ever faced before both internal threats and external threats, because its political institutions that have been there for centuries were un under um, unprecedented strain. You had domestic reformers, you had minority groups inside the country clamoring for their own independent states. So the Turks were um, unfortunately had to fight several wars against former territories in the Balkans that they controlled. You had Armenian and, and um, Arab activists who sought greater autonomy inside the Ottoman Empire. Now, these issues dominated the Ottoman government in the years leading up to the Great War in 1914 and laid the foundations for the Ottomans and what they're going to do during the Great War. So the emperor, well, I not the emperor, he's the sultan. It was a man named Abdul Hamid II. They've been the sultan since, they became sultan in 1876. And upon taking control, he um, promulgated a constitution in 1876. It's supposed to be representative of parliament, everything was supposed to represent the country. But the thing is, immediately the Ottomans ended up in a war with Russia. Russia was the great threat to the Ottoman Empire because key territories, what the Russians had always wanted, they wanted the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus. They wanted to control access to the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and take Istanbul from the Ottomans. They had been fighting against the Ottomans off and on since the time of Catherine the Great and taking territories from them. So Abdi, Abdul Hamid, disp um, what she say? he suspended the Constitution in 1877 and took away all the liberties of the people in the Ottoman Empire trying to keep the empire together. He became an autocrat, is what happens. Now, one of the reasons is, because like I said, the Russians covering this territory, you had the russia turkish War of 1877. The Ottomans lost. Abdul Hamid signed an armistice because he didn't have a choice. It's interesting, he still at the time had his parliament, but his parliament said they could not sign this armistice, but he says, no, we have to sign it. We cannot win. We have lost this. So a meeting is organized in Berlin. Um, the great statesman of Europe in, um, in the late 19th century, of course, was a man named Otto von Bismarck of Germany. So the Congress of Berlin, which took place from June to July 1878, the Ottomans are going to lose two-fifths of the territory they control and one-fifth of their population. Especially in the Caucasus regions. Two territories, well, three territories particularly up in this region were handed over to the Russians. They had significant Armenian populations. And the Armenians, of course, were Christians. The Russians, part of the reason they fought for years against the Ottomans, of course, was they thought it was their right to protect Christians inside the Ottoman Empire, besides simply grabbing territory. Them. Like I said, the thing is, um, some argue that 
losing these territories in eastern Anatolia, the Ottomans saw that as their um, version of what France saw as losing Alsace and Lorraine to the Prussians back in 1871. It was territories they coveted and they wanted them back from the Russians if they could get them in the future. So, then Cyprus was taken by the British. They took the opportunity. Britain also annexed Egypt in 1882 because Egypt was technically part of the Ottoman Empire, but it had been autonomous for a very long time. And why the British were going to annex it? They wanted a little something called the Suez Canal. Because the, um, the government in Egypt had gone bankrupt, and at the time, the British owned 40% of the stock in the Suez Company, so they moved troops in to take control of it. Then um, the French go into Tunisia, take control of that, so what happens is the Ottomans, because the weakened states, start losing territories. Abdul Hamid, though, he manages to keep control of the rest of the Ottoman territories from 1882 to 1908. How he does it, he's an autocrat. Everyone lost their rights. He ruled with an iron fist. Well, by 1908, though, you have what are called the Young Turks. The Young Turks are a coalition of parties. It's not just one party. But the most important one on the umbrella of the Young Turks is what was called the Committee of Union and Progress, the CUP. They're also known as the Unionists. And it started out as a secret society of civilians and military men. Because how the government is going to change is going to be the Ottoman military. Particularly an army that's stationed in what is Macedonia. Well, the um, security forces, of course, had started stepping up, uh, looking for these members of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, It started stepping up. Um, looking for different groups, especially like the Armenians, who were talking about independence, having independent states inside the Ottoman Empire. You know, they wanted autonomous regions. Now, the C so the CUP had started especially watching operations in the Balkan regions, in Al Albania and Macedonia. It feels just like class. So what happens is the Ottoman the Ottoman Third Army, which is located in, um, in Macedonia, is going to cause an uprising led by a man named Ishmael Enver, Major Ishmael Enver, who will be named later as Enver Pasha. Major Ahmed, <laughs> who will be known as Kamala Pasha. And another man named Mohamed Talat, who is the military inspector of railways in the Ottoman Empire. These three men will be key to running the empire from 1908 on. They're not going to remove them, the Sultan. Abdul Hamid will be there for another year, and then they'll put another sultan in place. So they restore the Constitution in July of 1908. People are all excited. There's hopes that you know, they, they've taken over. The thing is, you know, the hopes are raised that this constitutional revolution has drawn all these various diverse groups together. They see hopes. One of the, um, one of the um, Armenian groups that have been trying to foment revolution and become part of the political process in 1806. 18, uh, 1907, sorry, was part of this. So everybody's happy. So for a brief moment, you had all this patriotism in the country. Things are going to be better, right? But it turned out to be disillusionment on their part. People were upset the Sultan was left on the front. They wanted to get rid of the Sultan. They wanted a constitutional, real constitutional government. One thing is, uh, the young Turks, I'm going to argue, they lacked confidence. Most of these men were in their late 20s and early 30s. They didn't have a lot of experience trying to run a country which takes experience, especially when you're controlling a large multi-ethnic empire, which is under threat, especially from various European powers. So the Europeans seized on this weakness. Well, the state started annexing more territories. Bulgaria became independent in October of 1908. Bosnia-Herzegovina, the territory will be annexed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which, of course, is one of the things that will cause problems that helps lead the First World War, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is killed in Sarajevo. In, uh, so, um, also Crete was taken. It joined with, with Greece at the time. So, the young Turks see all these threats around them. A brief counter-revolution broke out in April of um, 1909, and that led to, Daniel showed you the video about Adana. In Adana in 1909, 20,000 Armenians were slaughtered. There was a sign. But the, but the um, young Turks survived the counter-revolution and took control back over. And the roots of these type of what we call a pogrom. The Russians had done them against Jews for years, for centuries, I should say, killing people. It happened back in the 1870s. Now, of course, what happens is in the course of the First World War, the hostility 
between various groups is going to metastasize, and you'll see the first genocide of the 20th century, what happens to the Armenians. Well, some Ottoman leaders suspected the Armenians of being um, a minority community, as they called it, with a nationalist agenda, intent on seceding from the empire down the road. Now, in the Ottoman Empire, various um, minority groups lived in would organize what they called millets, faith communities. Because you had a lot of Christians, you had a lot of Jews in the Ottoman Empire at the time. Now, the Armenians, of course, were seen, they were a distinct ethnic group with their own language, their own culture, their own, you know, own religious practices, you know, and centuries of communal organization. They were organized. They had all the prerequisites for what would lead to, what we think would lead to a nationalist movement, a movement for their own state. The largest concentration of Armenians was in the city of Istanbul, but the key thing is, the one thing they lacked is they were split up in various parts of the empire, in eastern Anatolia, um, Sicilia, and, and of course Istanbul, so they don't have one concentrated area, which most nationalist groups you know, had, they're split up. And the Armenians themselves figured what they needed was great power support. They need someone to step in to help them if they were going to get an autonomous state, and particularly they looked at thinking of the Russians. They didn't really trust the British and the French in many ways, but they were thinking about the Russians. So, the Armenians were, had a delegation at the Congress of Berlin back in 1878, and it's the first time they argued for territory. They wanted three provinces that had been ceded to Russia. They talked about, well, you've done that, you've given these territories to the Russians. What we want is provinces in eastern Anatolia that aren't part of the Russians and have an autonomous state and have what they said we would like of a European governor for this time. So an autonomous state inside Ottoman domains is what they had asked for. So they claimed, of course, great, now my phone is A former colleague from the science department, Dr. Lou Foster. <laughs> I guess he forgot what we were doing this evening. <laughs> Try asking how it went, not realizing it's over. <laughs> so one thing the Europeans are going to do, they're going to, in the Treaty of Berlin, they're going to talk about the provinces inhabited by the Armenians. So in the Treaty of Berlin, the European powers, the Germans, the French, and the British in particular, and the Russians, inserted a clause. The Ottoman government was supposed to, that the Ottoman government agreed to implement immediately such improvements and reforms demanded by local requirements in the provinces inhabited by the Armenians, and to provide them with security from attack by the Muslim majority. This was written in there by the European powers. And the treaty also required that Istanbul report periodically to the various leaders of the European nations about how things were going, you know, what they were, what they were following through with this. You know, are they taking steps to protect their Armenian citizens? Of course, that was incredibly insulting to the Sultan. So, what do you mean I got to report to you guys? I'm a Sultan of a, you know, the large empire. But European support, like I said, for Christian national movements in the Balkans, of course, is going to be key. So, the, the, the Ottomans became very wary, especially of the Western powers, and they're fearful of what the Russians are going to do in the future. So the Treaty of Berlin, like I said, gave the Armenians great aspirations that they'd have their own autonomous state at one point. So really, you could say that the distinct threat that the Ottoman leaders are going to see is coming from the Armenians, and because it was literally something that happened back in 1878. So, well, of course, what Abdul Hamid's government had done up until 1909, they had tried to put, stamp down um, Armenian groups. They saw as this nascent, nascent, um, nationalist movement with ties to the British and the Russians in particular. So Armenian activists by the 1880s could begin forming political organizations. The Ottomans treated them like they did any other opposition groups and responded with the full range of oppressive <coughs> actions, of course, surveillance, arrest, imprisonment, exile. And two distinct national societies, Armenian national societies, emerged at the end of the 19th century. Students in Switzerland and France organized what was called the Hunchek, Society in Geneva in 1887. Um, Hunchek, I believe, is the word, I mean, word for bell. And then in 1890, you have a group of activists in Russia, which launched the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, better known as Dashnik. It's based off of the Armenian word, along with what I don't even try to pronounce. 
that means essentially apparently federation. They're different movements because they had divergent, divergent um, ideologies and um, methods. The Hunchak group had debated the relative merits of socialism and national liberation. Liberation came as big. The Dashniks promoted self-defense. They wanted an autonomous state inside the Ottoman Empire. They argued for it. And they argued that you should have self that the Armenians should be protected in the Ottoman Empire and the Russians should make sure they protect their Armenian communities at the same time. Now both societies espouse the use of violence to achieve their goals. They said you use violence. Because they see themselves as freedom fighters. We always talk about it all the time. One person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. So the Armenian the Ottoman Empire the government sees them as terrorists, not as freedom fighters. So their activities um, exactly exacerbated tensions between uh, Muslims and Christians, particularly in Eastern Anatolia, and skipping over a few things, between 1894 and 1896, there are estimates that 200,000 Armenians perished during that time period with the violence between the various groups. It happened. Of course, um, the ideas of using terrorism were you know, not looked upon favorably, of course, by the European powers. They did not approve of that. The good thing is that the, the European powers were kind of divided in their policies concerning what we call the Armenian question, what was going to happen in the future with this. Because the years 1894 to 1896 could pretty much were a catastrophe. 200,000 people perishing, you know, all this violence. So what happens is the Dashniks, the revolutionary group, they change their tactics. They want to be recognized as a legal organization, and by eight, 1907, you had 14 of them elected to the parliament to the lower house of the parliament. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but of course then, later when you had this counter-revolution against the government, you had the massacre of Adana in 1909. Now, international attention was drawn after what happened in Adana in 1909. Other countries started looking what was happening over there. It's, so, um, the Dashniks agreed that they would continue to cooperate as long as these things like this did not happen again. You know, the government protected start. Now, Kamal, one of the leaders, Kamal Pasha, claimed that within four months they had rebuilt most of the city. There's no real evidence of that, but that's what he claimed over the time later on. Then the young Turks find themselves having to fight two Balkan wars. Because the Serbians, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, and what happens is they lose all their territory pretty much in what is um, Europe, right? And what's going to happen is you're going to start to see population exchanges. Destitute Muslims are kicked out, they're kicked out of their homes when they show up in the Ottoman Empire, they're destitute, so the Ottomans in return will start kicking out Christians. And in particular, they started kicking out Christian Greeks, who a lot of them resisted. They'd lived in the Ottoman Empire for centuries. They didn't want to leave. But their, their homes were given away to Muslims coming from these other territories. Well, the one thing is, the Greeks had somewhere to go. When the Ottomans turn on the Armenians, they really don't have any place to go for them to be trans, you know, transported to. Now, the Ottomans, of course, by 1913, desperately needed an alliance. And what they're going to do is turn to the Germans. Because the French and the British in particular have been exploiting the Ottoman Empire economically for a very long time. They had what we call the capitulations. Like if you were a French merchant and you cheated someone of the Ottoman Empire, you know, no matter who it was, you could not be tried by the Ottoman authorities. You were protected by your consulate. So you had no good crimes and everything else, they were protected, and economic advantage had been taken by the Europeans. The Ottoman government actually had gone bankrupt back in 1875. So they were they were deep financial, well, had deep financial ties to the French and the British. So they decided to side with the Germans when the First World War breaks out. Side with the Germans. They thought the Germans were going to win. So they became what was known as one of the central powers. Germany, Austria, Hungary and the Ottoman Empire versus mainly Russia, uh, France, and Great Britain, which the Americans go in later. So the war early on is not going to go well. Um, the Ottomans, the key, the key um, battle they lost in a place called Syracamis, the la battle lasted from December 1914 to early January 1915. The Ottomans lost 60,000 men killed. Then disease spread throughout all of eastern Anatolia, killing over 150,000 civilians in about six months. You had typhus, you had dysentery. Well, some members of the Young Turk government at the time declared that the Ottoman 
Armenian population was a dangerous fifth column. In other words, the Armenians were not on the side of the Ottomans. And the Unionists, who were really in control at this time, members of the CUP, talked about mobilizing the average citizens to assist in maybe the annihilation of the Armenian population. So you had terrible conditions throughout the countryside. And by the spring, the spring of um, 1915, the Ottomans are losing on three fronts. They're losing against the Russians in eastern Anatolia, the British are rolling through Mesopotamia almost unopposed, and French and British troops land in the, in the Dardanelles, what was called the Gallipoli Campaign. So it looked like the empire was going to collapse quickly. And what happens in Istanbul, of course, is people openly, Armenians openly, were happy. The Allies were there. They were going to take control of Istanbul. Their autonomous state. And there was one um, clergyman, Malikin, talked about it. He said it was dangerous, people talking about this, because you had collaborators, Armenian collaborators, plus you had a very effective secret, secret uh, police organization at the time. Now it's interesting, the, um, the, the Ottomans back in February of 1914, before the war starts in August, had agreed to the, the agreed to something called the Armenian Reform Agreement with Russia. It signed an agreement with them, which called for the organization of six easternmost provinces bordering Russia into two administrative <laughs> units, and they would, it would provide an autonomous homeland for the Armenians. December 1914, the Ottomans tossed that out the window. They had no intention of honoring back in February of 1914, but they were under duress, is why they had signed this agreement. So on December 16, 1914, they abrogated and said, no, that'll never happen. Then you have a meeting. The three men took place between February and March of 1915. You have Dr. Banahim Sakir, who was the head of the secret police at the time. And he was a member of, uh, of the Unionist. Um, they had the Committee of Union and Progress had what they called a Central Committee. And he was a member. He was one of the top guys. And Sakir had been in eastern Anatolia and seeing what was taking place there. So when he comes back to Istanbul, he's going to meet with Talat Pasha. Talat Pasha was the interior minister of the Ottoman Empire, a very powerful individual. And they're joined by a man named Dr. Mehmed Nazim, who was also a member of the Central Committee. Now, Sakir told them, he addressed his members of this meeting. He said, the enemy within, because of the occupational Oppositional stance of the Armenians had taken toward Turkey and the assistance that were affording to the Russian army, they were the enemy within the country and something needed to be done. Now the thing is, there is not really any transcripts of the meetings that these men had. Of course, when you're planning to kill a whole bunch of people, it's kind of not it's kind of smart not to write it down, right? The Nazis, of course, kept everything triplicate. It's the Bonacy Conference. Of course, deniers say the Holocaust never happened, say Hitler had nothing to do with it because Hitler was smart enough not to sign the documents. The Nazis had everything triple. These guys are making plans, and they're not keeping records of what they intend to do. So, documents and memoirs of some of the men suggest that these three men were the officials that made the decisions initiating the annihilation of the Armenians, the Armenian, Armenian community in Turkey. So between February and March 1915, seems when the decisions were made. Now, first they moved to um, remove Armenians from Cilicia. Talat Pasha was in charge of that in the central area because the British had established a blockade. So they moved them out of that area, and it took a lot of them to adopt. They made no um, preparations for having all these people come, so of course a lot of people starved. Well, the Ottomans were actually having problems with actual soldiers dying of starvation in hospitals. Things were so bad in parts of the country. Then, of course, on the eve of the Allied landings, the Anzacs, the Australians and New Zealanders are going to land on the Dardanelles on the 25th of April. The night of the 24th, the secret police acted, and they rounded up 240 of the most important Armenian intellectuals in the city of Istanbul. Because the plan was, of course, to decapitate the political and cultural leadership of the Armenians their community, because they figured the Armenians were going to side with the Allies, and they'd seen that they were happy that the Allies were in the region. They were moving there. And the idea was they figured the Armenians were going to take common cause with the invaders, so they moved together. 
So you had most of these notables were routed up in the middle of the night. Most of them were still wearing their bedclothes. It's kind of like these to show series about the Nazis coming in, grabbing people in the middle of the night. The Soviets did the same thing. Well, this happened on April 24th, 1915. So they arrested the political and intellectual leadership of the Armenians in Istanbul and initiated the systematic destruction of the Armenian communities of Anatolia. And the 24th is remembered as Armenian Genocide Memorial Day. And that is where I'm going to stop my talk, because this is where things start. And the thing is about this, the government took, I guess you'd say, a two-track approach, we could call it. Openly, they're deporting people to various areas, hoping a lot of them will die along the way, they'll be killed by bandits, various armed groups, and they'll be gone, right? So people know about the deportations, but the whole thing is, underneath all that, they plan to make sure they were annihilated, to get rid of them. Now it's interesting, of course, the bitter irony is that the Ottomans turning on some of the people of their country had no impact on how they were turning on. It didn't impact whatsoever. And of course, the Ottomans were on the losing side. Thank you. So what Dr. Hamann mentioned are all the important facts in what eventually led to the culmination of the genocide on April, 5th, April 24th, sorry, 1915, which is the Remembrance Day of the genocide. Uh, and the commemorations take place all over the world to this very day. In California, Glendale, California, I don't know if anyone's ever been there, but that's the biggest Armenian population in the U.S. Okay, so now I would like to introduce a friend of mine that I've known for almost all of my years here at, uh, in the U.S. She's a very bright young woman and is currently a pre-med. She moved from Yerevan, Armenia, the capital of Armenia, when she was four years old and has lived in Nashville ever since. She's currently a senior studying biochemistry at Belmont University in Nashville. So help me welcome Ms. Nelly Grigoryan. my own family history, how I ended up here in Tennessee, and just a few contemporary um, Armenian topics. So, oh, let's go a little bit separated. Oh well, so um, I ended up here in Nashville, Tennessee in November of 1997. I came with my parents, um, following my grandparents who came a couple of years before we did. Um, and 1991 was when the Soviet Union, as some of you might know, when it collapsed, there was this, a lot of turmoil following um, all of the republics, especially Armenia, following this collapse. Um, actually, the 1990s are known as the dark years in Armenia. Um, there was there would be prolonged periods without any power, without any water, without any heat, and um, there was rampant inflation. People's entire life savings were basically becoming worthless overnight. So um, as many people escaped basically as they could, and my family was fortunate enough to be one of those people. My um, grandparents, they moved to Nashville a couple of years before we did. Um, they, got, they had won actually some sort of a green card lottery type of thing, and um, when they moved, they came to Nashville and they applied for um, me and my family, me and my parents, to actually get green cards and come too. And a couple of years later, we did. We ended up in Nashville, of all places. It's kind of an interesting place to come as immigrants in in America because um, at the time and still as of today, most of the Armenian immigrants in America are, are in LA or New York or Boston. So Nashville is kind of an interesting place to come and settle. <laughs> like LA, New York, Boston, Nashville. So, <laughs> it's, it happened and we've been here ever since. So um, my, my, all of my family, of course, was able to come. Um, some of us were, but as you can see in this picture, this is me with my two cousins and my cousin's girlfriend. This picture was taken when me and my mom went to Armenia after I graduated high school back in 2012. We're just in downtown Yerevan. Um, as you can see, it's a bustling little metropolis of a city. And um, this picture right here is also taken from the trip. It's me and my mother, and um, we went to an Armenian church. Since Armenia has a rich history of um, Christianity, there are churches throughout the entire country. Um, since also, also some other people in my family have come to Nashville as well. Um, I have a couple of cousins that are here. Um, we have some family friends that lived with us in our apartment complex. They moved here too. So we've 
kind of established a little um, Armenian community in Nashville. There are also some Armenians that, are, that weren't from Yerevan that came too. There's a lot of Armenians that have been spread throughout uh, the entire world in Russia and in Azerbaijan, and some of them came um, as refugees to Nashville as well. So we have established our little Armenian community. Daniel and I actually know ourselves through the Armenian Church of Nashville, which we go to once every month. <laughs> 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 yes. um, so, just a few um, contemporary, I'm just here to talk about a few contemporary issues, I guess, in Armenia. Right here, I have a picture of the um, Armenian Genocide Memorial, which is just on the outskirts of Yerevan. I have not actually been to it before, even though I've been to Armenia a couple of times, but um, it's definitely something that I want to visit the next time that I do get to go to Armenia, which I don't know when that will be, but hopefully it will be soon. Um, <laughs> hopefully it will be soon. Who knows where life will take us, right? But So it's quite a very large, it's a very um, lovely monument. There is uh, exterior, as you can see here, is a large statue and some pillars, but you can actually go inside of the pillars, and here there is this um, eternally burning flame that usually has a whole bunch of flowers around it. It's just uh, a commem commemoration towards all the millions of victims of the genocide. If you guys were um, keeping up with the Kardashians by any chance, <laughs> you know that uh, Kim and Courtney went last year to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the genocide. They went to this monument and there's some pictures of them laying down flowers. So they kind of made it a little bit more well known. So I kind of have to give them props for that, right? They kind of put Armenia on the map for us. <laughs> because back then, the back will not so much, I guess. It's kind of variable as to just how many people really know about Armenia. Sometimes I would say, oh, I'm Armenian. People are like, oh, Romanian, totally. I'm like, no, I'm Armenian. That's what those are. We like, But now, now when people, it's kind of different now because now when you say you're Armenian, people are like, oh, just like the Kardashians. Yeah, sure, that's, that's how you're going to remember it. At least you know what Armenia is. <laughs> Better than thinking is romantic. <laughs> so um, this is a billboard that was put up actually in a Boston neighborhood just a few weeks ago. Um, this was this billboard was put up by a Turkish organization called Fact Check Armenia. It's um, an organization of Turks that actually perpetuate denial of the genocide, as um, the genocide talks have been more pre prevalent lately and. So you guys may have heard um, there, the Turkish government does not officially establish, uh, does not officially uh, recognize the Armenian genocide. Neither does the, Ameri uh, the USA actually, as it is a strong ally of Turkey. They're, they have interest in not uh, acknowledging the genocide. And this uh, billboard was put up in a predominantly, well, I wouldn't say it was predominantly, but it was a neighborhood in Boston that had a large number of Armenians. And of course, there was a large public outcry. Um, people complained, people protested. There were petitions that were sent all over the city, and this billboard only lasted for a few days. It was actually taken down very quickly. You can see in this billboard, it's enormous. It's very, very eye-catching. Anybody that's walking through the area would immediately take notice of it. Um, you can see on the left and right, the Armenian and Russian flags. They have their fingers crossed, basically saying, oh, we're the liars. And uh, Turkish have their, the Turkish flag has their fingers up as in, oh, we're the ones telling the truth, so it's kind of uh, wakes you up and you can see that this genocide denial, this um, all of this is not just in the past, it didn't just happen 100 years ago, nobody even cares about it today, it's denial of this is still perpetuated even in a place like America. Um, so go moving on with the topic of contemporary Armenian issues, I'm just going to briefly give a little explanation as to uh, an important topic that is going on in Armenia today. I'm um, just going to start off just out of curiosity. How many of you guys have ever heard of the Gharabakh region before? Daniel, Zabon, I know you A few more, my mom. So, Gharabakh, it's not, I wasn't really expecting anybody to know much about it. It's not an issue that's really um, talked about in Western, in Western media, but um, Karabakh is an independent region in uh, Azerbaijan. It used to be part of Azerbaijan um, throughout the entire rule of the Soviet Union. Um, this is a region that is um, entirely, at least up to date, is entirely consisting of Armenian Christians. Um, back before the Bolshevik Revolution when the Soviet Union was established, 
and Armenia and Azerbaijan and all of these uh, territories were still territories of Russia. Uh, this Karabakh this was full of Armenians, but when uh, the Bolshevik Revolution happened and uh, their territories were divided, um, the Soviets gave the Karabakh region to Azerbaijan. It became an Azerbaijani territory, and it remained that way throughout, throughout the entire Soviet Union. But as you all know, in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, the, Ar the Armenians that still predominated this region throughout the entire Soviet Euro rule um, had always wanted their independence from Azerbaijan throughout really the entire time they were part of the Soviet Union. But when they collapsed, they kind of took their opportunity. Um, there was a referendum throughout the region, and it became an independent region. It was no longer part of Azerbaijan. It wasn't really part of anything. It was just kind of an independent region. It was kind of in a little bit of a gray area. Um, of course, the Azerbaijans did not, Azerbaijanis did not like this because they felt that they had been given Karabakh by the Soviets when they had been, uh, when ter territories had been appropriated. And so they weren't going to give up this region without a fight. And fight is exactly what happened. Um, from 1991 through 1994, there was um, actually massive war and bloodshed throughout the regions with massive casualties on both sides. Um, the, our Azerbaijanis wanted to take the territory of Karabakh back. They basically didn't care that there had been a referendum in the region and that the uh, people of Karabakh had established their independence. They were saying, you know, this is ours and we're going to take it back. Well, they didn't get to take it back. The uh, Azerbaijanis were able to preserve their independence and it remained an independent region up until today, actually. But the reason that this is an important topic just as of very, very recently, is there was a ceasefire that continued from uh, 1994 up until just a few days ago in early April, where um, the ceasefire was never really a true, true ceasefire. There was always um, a little bit of unrest, a little bit of minor fighting throughout the region, but it escalated drastically in early April, just a few days ago, where um, the Azerbaijani uh, military attacked the borders most of uh, Karabakh attacked um, civilians and military as well, and of course they were going to take this lane down, so they struck back. So there was an escalation of conflict that occurred for just a few days. It was it was not a very prolonged, but there was a Russian diplomacy stepped in finally, and uh, they negotiated a ceasefire between the two regions. But it was very very interesting how it erupted just suddenly after 22 years of relative peace. Um, America, of course. They have a bit of an interest in the region as um, they have allies around there. And so America kind of wants to know, oh, what are we going to do here? It's very interesting. I read an article about how some of the presidential candidates today can barely even point out Azerbaijan on a map, let alone, let alone Karabakh. So what are they going to do about it, you know? So it's kind of something to think about, especially for those of us who are uh, familiar with the region and care about what happens there. It's uh, something that's the most important thing to take away from this is that peace needs to be established throughout the region. Just uh, no escalation of fighting is really necessary as of now. But that's all I have today. Okay, just before we continue, I just want to clarify something. You guys laughed when she said we're going once a month. It's because it's only offered once a month. <laughs> it's only once a month, so we'll try to go as often as we can. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Nelly uh, John. You, you may have heard that word before, because uh, it's very common for Armenians to use the word John after you say a name. For example, Nelly John. Uh, in English, you would translate into deer. So thank you, dear Nelly. <laughs> when I came to Pulaski in January 2013, uh, I immediately Googled Armenians in Nashville, and I found the Armenian Church of Nashville that Nelly was talking about in Franklin, Tennessee. Upon my first visit, I got to meet this cool guy my age who told me that he moved to Tennessee right before his freshman year of high school. I told him that I'd never been to Armenia, and he told me that he was going to visit his family over there that same summer. And before I knew it, he invited me to come and visit them. He's a professional photographer, and he's going to show, he's going to show us some interesting pictures. But most importantly for me, he's a close friend of mine. So please help me welcome my dear friend, Levon Mekirchen. Thank you, guys.
Nani. John? <laughs> Thank you guys for having me here today. Uh, thanks NMC and Daniel for organizing this. Um, I'm a photographer, so naturally I'm not going to talk very much. Instead, instead I'm going to present several photographs to you. Uh, not my own, but photographs from the genocide that will hopefully speak louder than any words can. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of my hometown, Yerevan, where Nelly and me are from. Um, when I visited there last year, I saw my uh, great aunt from my dad's side for the first time, and I found out that I'm a fourth generation Armenian uh, survival from my dad's side. Um, this is a map of Turkey uh, during 1915. Uh, as you can see on the bottom uh, right, My dad's uh, family was from Mush, where uh, it's a red dot on the big red dot on the bottom uh, right, uh, M-U-S. Uh, from there, they uh, went up to fled the genocide, went up to Alexandrople. You can see it on the, it's, a, it's in eastern Armenia now, which is called Gyumbi, and then from there they moved to Yerevan. Uh, but that's enough about me. I really want to show you a few, few photographs from. Uh, send it to Germany and US and I'm going to show you some of them these are uh, some of his plates um, this is a Turkish official teasing Armenian starving Armenian children with uh, bread and some of these are really graphic so if you guys don't want to you know close your eyes if you're sensitive to stuff like that some uh, 1.5 to 2 million Armenians were killed during the, during the massacres. Mm. Armenian population being marched uh, through the desert.
Many more photographs are found uh, in the Armenian Genocide Museum in Yerevan, where we're from. Um, and uh, the museum is located next to, as Nelly mentioned, the Genocide Memorial, where thousands and thousands of people on April 24th, uh, where, when all the intellectuals were massacred, um, are um, march, march every year to the memorial and set flowers by the flag. Uh, this last year marked the uh, centennial of the Armenian Genocide. So the marches were all over the world. In Moscow, Texas, Paris, these are some of the, they look some of the pictures. Uh, in LA, about 130,000 Armenians marched to protest. As far as recognition, this is where we stand today. As you see, the yellow areas are the areas where um, the other countries that have recognized the Armenian Genocide. And as you can see, US is one of the uh, most important countries, the most influential countries that still hasn't recognized the uh, genocide. Here's a map of U.S. states that have to recognize the genocide. So we're uh, making progress in that sense. Um, I think Georgia is uh, great, but I think as far as last month, they proposed legislation to um, recognize the genocide as well. Um, so you say, why is, it, why is it important that we recognize the genocide? And uh, the question, the answer to that question really is summed up in this quote by a guy you might recognize. Um, and I want to read that. It says, uh, Our strength lies in our intense attacks and our barbarity. After all, who today remembers the genocide of the Armenians? And this happened before uh, Hitler um, uh, annihilated the Jewish population in Germany and all over Europe. So that's Thank you, guys. So now that we know the facts, we've seen pictures of the massacres, and we got to hear some personal stories, I would like to move on to something slightly different. Uh, what about the people that survived the genocide? Do they have stories that give the same facts as the history books do? In Armenia, this sweet, sweet woman of 104 years tells her story on what happened. In Yerevan, Armenia, I found Maria, 104 years old. She could have been my grandma, my sweet grandma. Mama, how's it going? Chair, what's it? 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 Chair, Mm -hmm. 
Onlar günah çantıkla günah. Çantık dışarı kere çıkıyor. Akçikler neyin danım? Akçikleri neyin danım? Ha, akçikleri neyin danım? Var bir de fırna parın, kamış karın karın. Ne tağı polor kervana aretim. Tağı polori duru kervana ya. Et mektum ağırlık bor mu ki? Ne at şunu ne dene? Ay eser, bana mesela şunu turu ki dene tohutu. Miçem yeşeriz mi yok ki veyga? Ama Türkiye'nin likuyla Karahan'ın meclubu kere çıkar da ne? Ağızına mı meclubu? Kişeri konuş ki dağını mekmek. Lani mağdurduruz işime kişeri konuş ki dağını. Çem uzun işe varsa, kınar avuca çem dağını moran. Kınar avuca çem dağını moran. Vali canımın oruçlarının kınar dinler avucuna sintesek duyurlar. Да, амнистации. Эра. Эра, эра. Панчика, 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 панчика. Tragic stories like these are happening in the Middle East right as we speak, mainly in Syria. In the first half of the 20th century, many Armenians ran away from their homes. This next speaker is a second generation American citizen, grew up in Fresno, California, to where his grandparents fled. And they told him many stories about their horrific experiences at the hands of the Turkish oppressors. He is currently an adjunct professor at Martin Methodist College in its Center for Executive and Professional Development, where he teaches project management after his 40-year-long career, career in information technology. He's also a full-time teacher at Giles County High School, where he teaches engineering and robotics in the career and technical education department. Please help me welcome Mr. Ron Kremenjian. that video that nice woman reminded me much of my grandmother and some of the stories she told me. And I could probably stand up here and allow myself to dredge up the stories and get as angry as I possibly could. Because I heard those stories when I was young. The first story I remember was when I was three or four about my grandmother's experience on one of the, from one of these raids, where she saw her aunt murdered. My grandfather came here in 1909 after the first incident. My grandmother arrived in the United States in 1920 at the age of 16. My grandparents were married very shortly after that. <laughs> and my father was born just a little over a year after her arrival. Both of my grandparents told stories that I didn't understand, at least until after I got out of the service. I got a few of my own there. So I could go through all of that and dredge that up and tell you about the anger and the hatred and the unmitigated bloodlust that they expressed to me on occasion. I can even tell you about my own joyful exuberance when we blew up the Turkish ambassador in Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles in 1982. 
because it was fueled by all that. But after Daniel called me to come talk, I started wondering about, what am I going to talk about? Am I really going to tell those stories? And, and I kind of decided that that's not what you need to hear. What you need to hear is about the people that my grandparents were. I have two very particular stories that I'm going to tell you. First, about my grandfather. My grandparents originally established themselves in New York. My grandfather worked for four years for the city of New York. He was a street sweeper when they still used the broom shovel. Uh, he retired from New York, and when he retired, he moved to Fresno, California, where my father had already established. They bought a pretty nice little house out in the county. Didn't have sidewalks. It was on a half acre lot, so it was a pretty good sized lot. And my grandfather set about every year to put in a garden. Now, I went with my grandfather when he did most of his chores when I was young. And we used to walk about a mile down the road to the old chicken shack where we get old chicken in there, bring that back, and he'd go out in his garden. Now, mind you, this is a quarter acre garden. Okay. And he'd take his old shovel and shovel that manure in and then turn every inch of that backyard. I couldn't find the weed in that place the whole time he was alive, because he was out there all the time. He dug his own wine cellar underneath that house. You know what he did with the dirt? That man filled every pothole in the dirt next to the road because we didn't have sidewalks in that area for probably a square mile. Okay? In the summertime when his garden would start to produce, you can imagine that with that much of the garden, there was no way he was going to be able to eat all of it. So he would take bags of fresh vegetables and leave them at the houses for all of the poor people in easily a mile area. He knew them all, they all knew him, and he fed them. That's the kind of generosity my grandfather had with the poor of his heart. Okay. That's the man that I love. And that's the man I want you to think about. My grandmother. <clears throat> I love my grandmother more than just about any person on the planet because she was just as kind-hearted as he was. But she was a hard man. And she grew up through that. But she learned very quickly that if you want something, you have to get it. You have to go after it. After she moved to start having children in New York, it became apparent that because my grandfather both my grandparents, mind you, became U.S. citizens. Back then, you had to be able to speak and read and write English to become a U.S. citizen. They believed in this country. They didn't speak anything but English outside the house. Not because they couldn't speak Armenian, because they lived in the Armenian community in New York. Okay? Because they were American citizens. We were proud of that. But as they had children and they started watching the families in New York around them have children, they noticed that the young people weren't speaking or able to speak Armenian. Many of them couldn't write or read Armenian. So my grandmother decided that she wanted to start an Armenian school. And there's a very large Armenian church that she attended, had a bishop. Um, have you, I don't know, any of you seen, yeah, I think you've all seen pictures of Greek Orthodox priests, long beards, and so forth. Armenian priests are very much the same. They're Orthodox, anyway. And she knew that there was a basement room 
It actually had desks in it for when this, there was a school there before that wasn't being used by the church. So she kept trying to speak to somebody at the church about starting a school. And the more they put her off and pushed her away, the more angry she got. And I've had several people in my family who knew about this confirm the story. Finally, she lost her temper. And one day after service, the bishop was walking down the front steps of the church. And she walked up to him and she grabbed his beard in one hand <laughs> and said, I want that room. I want those desks. And I want enough books to teach our children Armenian. She got the school. <laughs> Those are the kind of people that I come from. And, you know, hearing the stories and then having the images to go with them is horrific. But the Armenian people that I know are passionate people. Yeah, we have temper sometimes. We can get pretty hot about it but we also love with everything we have. We care for each other with everything we have. We give really from our hearts in general. We're warm people. But honey, don't do what my wife does. Occasionally, if you need being there, it's not okay. She likes to do that. Anyway, hey, that's what I want you to come away with this. There's a whole country of people who experience something horrific and much like the Jews have overcome it to a certain extent. The Jews have a significant lead on us in acceptance and recognition which has allowed them to heal a little bit faster but we'll get there. That's all I got to say. to talk about my story, I would just like to say that I cannot express how thankful I am for every one of you that has come tonight because this is a very important event for me. I think you noticed with all the posters everywhere, like everywhere you turn there's a poster, emails, me saying something to you guys about this. It's very important for me and uh, thank you to each and every one of you here tonight. So, this is President of Armenia and the other President, I'm pretty sure you all recognize, if not, uh, I I strongly suggest you find out. <laughs> Barack Obama has met with Armenia's president several times to discuss the issues surrounding the facts of these atrocities that took place. Money, politics, and power all go hand in hand. Um, and very importantly so, there are, there are the driving force in this world. Money, power, and politics. But despite this fact, there are many countries in this world that have officially recognized the Armenian genocide and uh, those are the ones as of today and we're getting close to the US recognition. Last year, uh, Pope Francis officially proclaimed that the mass killing of Armenians were a genocide. This was done at a mass in St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican uh, that was attended by uh, the Armenian Catholicos, Karakin II which is the, he's the supreme patriarch of Armenia, of the Armenian Apostolic Church. This mass commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, so it was last year. So let's get into some family history here. Uh, my mom's mother, my grandmother, is here on the very left. She was born in Jerusalem. Uh, her family had fled there from modern-day Eastern Turkey after the atrocities, after her father had lost almost his whole family during the genocide. My mom's father, who was at the very top, um, he was born in Athens, Greece, uh, since his family had fled there during the atrocities. And then they moved to Jerusalem, 
where he met my grandma. There's a big Armenian community in Jerusalem. I don't know if any of you know that, but Armenians, Jews, and Arabs all live side by side, even though it's not in peace, but they live side by side. Uh, and they, Armenians have their own church, school, monastery, and uh, their own quarter. It's called the Armenian Quarter. My coach has been there. She told me about that. Um, this is my dad in the middle. Uh, he was, uh, his father was born in modern-day Turkey as well. And in 1915, the year of the, the commemoration of the genocide, the intellectual killings, he was forced to hide with his family to try to escape from the massacres that were taking place. They often had to bribe officials to not be recognized as Armenians. And many of them uh, had to switch names too. When he turned 15, he moved to Bulgaria. Minka, you moved to Bulgaria, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is in Eastern Europe, uh, where his older brother had moved already. One of his brothers, my grandfather's brothers, was killed at a cafe in Turkey uh, for talking badly, for criticizing the, the Turkish uh, president, Kemal Atatürk. Uh, another of his brothers, my grandfather's brother, fled to Romania. Not Armenia, Romania. Uh, and he has a daughter that lives in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. And when my dad, my dad went last year, he got to meet her for the first time. And she's on the very right. Uh, this is my grandmother, my dad's mom. She was also born in modern day Turkey. Both of her parents were killed during the genocide, and she was smuggled out by other Armenians as an orphan to an orphanage in Bulgaria. And there she was adopted by an Armenian family. Her new father was running a clothing store, and he was very close friends with one of the key figures of the Armenian national movement. His name was Andranik Ozanyan, better known as Andranik Pasha, or Zoravar Andranik, which means General Andranik. I clearly remember when my grandmother told me the stories about him because uh, her father was very close friends with him. And the one time he apparently came to their house and stayed there for a week before going out to war uh, in the 1920s. She met my grandfather um, in Bulgaria um, and he's born in, so or they moved to Sofia, which is the capital of Bulgaria. And that's where my dad is born. He then moved to Beirut, Lebanon, and the final plan was to come to the US because it's the land of the free, right? But it didn't happen. But who knows, if they would have come to the US, maybe they would have ended up in Pulaski, Tennessee. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather eventually got contracted in Sweden, so the whole family moved to Sweden. My dad was visiting the Armenian quarter in Jerusalem, where my mom was born, and my mom was a teacher in the Armenian school. So she moved to Sweden with him, and that is where I come in the picture. that are connected to it. It's been a very, a very sensitive topic for me, and that's why I've been so happy to be able to share this with you tonight. And once again, I'm so, so happy that each, of, each and every one of you came here tonight, and I will forever cherish this moment. So thank you all. Aww.